A few years ago, Tilbury, the publisher, got an email and said, from a country, and if you know what this is, don't give it away. And they said, we want to publish our own. So this is um, the book Talking Walls, which was my first book. And Talking Walls was reissued. Here it is. It was reissued in 2015. So that we had two books, we combined it into one book and then I sort of rewrote it and I wrote it as a read aloud, six sentences or less. So teachers could really use it more, um, it, it wasn't just informational text, but you could get it, you could get the story done in one sitting. So um, the original book had like 10 or 12 sentences per text and that's really too long as a read aloud. So I changed it into a read aloud. So we got a phone call or, I don't know, some kind of information from this country. And they said, we're going to translate the whole book. Um, and here it is. But we really need our own cover because we want to tell a story about our country. So this is Annie. They hired Annie to do the cover. Actually, she, I think she actually came up with the idea for the cover. But the publisher in this country had to agree. So we're going to start. So. What's going on in this picture? So I want you just to look at the whole thing. And I want you to think about it. And then I want you to pair and share. So you tell your, well, your friend sitting next to you what you think's going on. So what's actually, so tell a story. I think and what you think's going on in this picture. So do that for a few minutes by yourselves. What's going on in this picture? So tell each other what you think. Oh, see, I'm seeing it more as a wall with the barbed wire that you can't get over, like on a border. I immediately thought of the Berlin Wall. Oh, I don't know why. I thought it was a color. It's not a better here. A wall with the barbed wire. You can't get over, but I also found of the wall with the barbed wire. You can't get over, but I also found the wall with the barbed wire. Because that's what you have. Well, it's not like the cover. All right, well, you did a great job. I hear great stories going on, so I need somebody brave to start. So this is what you're going to say because you're not really sure. So you have to say, I think. But pretty soon, we're going to make this big story, and then I will reveal, the big reveal, what this story is about and why it's on the front cover of this edition of the book. So somebody who would like to start, what's going on in this picture? I think, who wants to start? We need somebody brave. I heard all your stories, just tell me, please. <laughs> I think that these are people, families, that are looking for someone's name, or someone they know. Okay, so you think these are families looking for a name or someone they know. So what do you see in there that makes you think they're families? The way they're grouped. So we think they're families because maybe they're in a group and we think somehow these families are looking for names. Yeah. What do other people think is happening in the picture? It, it, it could be that. I mean, I was thinking of the Vietnam War Memorial, but it's that barbed wire makes me think that that's, it's a barrier somehow that they are kept in. So we think maybe it's a family, maybe looking at names, but now we think well, there's barbed wire, and barbed wire is a barrier, so somehow maybe this is keeping people in. So we have sort of two stories going. Or maybe it's keeping people out. So <laughs> what makes you think it would be keeping people out? I'm just looking at the way the barbed wire is facing the people who are looking at these colors. So because of barbed wire, we see that the barbed wire is facing the people. Maybe whatever this is. It could be families looking for names, but it could be something menacing because there's barbed wire and it looks like it's facing in, so maybe it's keeping these people out. So, sorry about that. I didn't know my computer died. No, there it's we go. okay. It's just because you didn't move it. Okay. So, what else is going on in the picture? Is there anything else? I, I, I immediately thought of a wall keeping people out, like at the border and initially thought Mexico and then looked at the letters and thought, okay, 
that's not Mexico. Maybe it's North Korea or something like that. Okay, so maybe you think this and is Mexico. Maybe it's, you immediately looked at it and you thought this is keeping people out. And maybe this is Mexico. And maybe this is North Korea. What, what in there makes you think that it's Mexico or North Korea? Well, what do you say? North Korea, simply because of the language at the bottom, makes me think more Asian. So perhaps this is an Asian language, perhaps this is Korean, and maybe this is something that separates, sort of like the wall in Mexico. Some people think it's very menacing because of the barbed wire, but then there's all these families here. But they've got a backpack, it could be refugees. <laughs> they could be a backpack, it could be refugees. Okay, nice story. Is there anything in the pictures, anything in this image that we have not talked about? The colors. <laughs> Okay, so now we, it's a little, we have happy people in a menacing place, maybe at a border, and maybe they're refugees. But they could just be families looking at a name. Yeah. And it could be Mexico, but someone thinks perhaps it's Korea because this looks like an Asian language. Okay, anything else we haven't talked about? The climate, it's warm. What makes you, what do the you see that makes you say it's warm? And the light clothing that they're wearing. And light the green clothing, grass. green grass, so where that, wherever this is, maybe it's, it's warm. Okay, so good job. Thank you for sharing the story. So you're pretty close. You're pretty close, good job. And you did all that just by looking and talking and sharing and listening. So this is in Korea. This book was translated, the whole book was translated in Korean. So. These are families, and yes, they're happy. These are happy families, but they are near a very sad place because it's barbed wire. So this is on the border of North and South Korea, and this is South Korea, and this is a wall of hope. And if you look carefully, these are ribbons. And they write messages, they're not, they're not, I don't know, I don't think they write families' names. They actually write messages of hope and uh, peace, hoping one day that the countries will be reunited. So if you look at the picture, you can actually see the ribbons. Oh. So everybody gets a ribbon, mm -hmm. and then they write. But, um, but it is right on the border. It's right on the border. So it's, it's, a, it's a message of peace. And everything else you got just by looking at the picture. So good job. So did they translate talking walls? Yeah, this is the whole book. Okay. So what they did is they translated the whole book. So in th this talking walls it ends with Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And they just added their story. And if you read Korean, which I don't read, but I'll tell you what it says, because I don't read it. So talking walls does not translate. So this says, culture and history, hearing walls of the world. So, but this is, a, and the, what's really cool about all this now is if the students you're working with or even you're interested, you can just Google the wall and see people at the wall today. You could probably see a video of people at every wall in this book. So good. So let's go over a little bit. The, the, the three question protocol. So I asked, what's the first question I asked? What's going on in this picture? And that's very different than what do you see? And I think that was done intentionally because what do you see just creates a list. What's going on in this picture creates a story. So I think that's a very powerful. We often in education say, well, what do you see? And they say, I see a red shirt. But if you say what's going on in this picture, immediately they have to turn it into a narrative. And what was my job? Of the, as the facilitator. What did I do? Just restated the things. I restated. Did I make any statements? <clears throat> did I make use anybody feel, well, she's so much smarter the way, so everything was just restated. Just I never said anything was good. I never said anything was bad. And kids really, really pick up on that immediately. They tell me right away, I like the way you did it. We were all right. Because you are all right because you're just thinking. You're just thinking. So in pure VTS, which I, this, I'm, this is not pure because I've altered it for academics. So in the, if you did this in an art museum, so I'll, t I'll, t I'll tell you the steps I've added. They don't pair and share, but that's such an important tool in education. 
to give kids a moment just to think so everybody can, and if you came into a classroom with me, um, kids love this so much it's almost sad because there's so little talking going on. So when you give them a chance to talk, one little kid came up to me afterwards, he said, I, I need to clap for myself. I did such a good job today. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, you do. And I'm like, the people probably don't let you talk very much. So, so, um, so in the pure VTS, they do this, look at the whole picture. Then they ask the three questions. And then, astonishingly, they say thank you. They don't tell you anything. They don't reveal the artist. They don't reveal anything about the art. It, they just want you to love art. So when I took the training at the Fine Arts Museum in Boston, it made me a little nervous because I knew I needed, I wanted to do this with my work in classrooms, and that just wouldn't fly. So I said to the trainer, so is there any way that you can, we can sort of shake this up a little, and can you show me one where you do give information? She said, yeah, we call that something else. So. She took me to a portrait of Benjamin Franklin, the one when he was young, and I thought, oh my God, there is nothing in here. And 10 minutes later, he, she, I had the, his whole life down. And then she added information, and that's what I like. I like the content. I think it's beautiful just to go look at a piece of art and say thank you very much. But I think in, for my, for, in a school, kids need to know something. You can't just say, oh, thank you very much and not tell them something. Mm -hmm. But that's just my opinion. So there's many, many different ways to do this. And the only way you become good at this is you practice. So we're going to do another one. We're just going to keep practicing. Cause it, and then, um, then when you get really good, then you're really happy. And then you'll start using it in many different ways besides. Um, Okay, so this is, I've never done this one before because I just got this. So this is very extra cool. All right, and this one you'll see. So, and these all have to, this has to do with my book, Talking Wall, so I give you, a, I just don't put some random picture up there. I will do one random one. So, look at this whole photograph. So this is a photograph that was sent to me. So look at the whole thing, and it has, Something to do with one of the walls in Talking Walls. So what's going on in this picture? So turn and tell each other or tell yourself or in this photograph. It's hard a little, it's a little light. If, if we could turn the light off, you could see it better, but no lights off? No. Just, just for a second? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just turn it off for a second? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> just for a second. Just turn oh. it's a huge difference so what's going on in this this is so 20 2019 yeah <laughs> so talk and tell each other what's going on in this okay. picture okay too happy people. I think Rainbow. I think I think the metropolitan mm. exhibit place some exhibit yes. 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 the front maybe yeah maybe yeah. yeah. it's like new walls I think oh yeah. Okay, you sound very good. So now we can do it. Do I have to? Yeah, you can turn the light back on. I can keep it off? Yeah, I'll just help do it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, what's going on in this? So, what's going on in this picture? Somebody want to start? I think. Oh, I bet they're taking a selfie. <laughs> okay, tell me the whole story. I think. I can't get much further than that because I'm not really sure what's going on. I see two very cheerful, happy young men probably taking a selfie of some sort. Okay, um, so we have somebody taking a selfie. What do you see in there to make you say that's a selfie? What do you see in that picture that makes you say it's a selfie? Uh, just the angle of the way they're taking the picture. So the angle, the way they're taking the picture tells you that somewhere in this picture is... Okay, so we have people, we think somebody's taking a selfie, so what else is going on? I think they're outside. You, you, so we think maybe they're outside. What do you see that makes you think they're outside? Just the, 
the bricks on the ground. Umbrella. There's, uh, there's an umbrella. So there's an umbrella, there's bricks on the ground, so maybe they're outside and these guys are just taking a selfie of something. Now remember, this has something to do with talking walls. So this, this, has, this is very much connected to my book. So I just didn't show this to you. Mm -hmm. So f that's when I give you that information, expand it. So you've talked, so what else is going on in the picture? I think it has something to do with the animals and wolves. So maybe, maybe over here we see some wolves. What, what do you see that makes you say they're wolves? Okay, you think they look like wolves? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's one up there that's maybe a puppy. I mean, they might be canines. Okay, so maybe these Could are canines, dogs. maybe yeah. these are wolves. So maybe we're outside. There's the somebody with an umbrella. And somebody's here taking a selfie. And so what else haven't you talked about yet? Well, the rainbow is striking, but... I'm having a hard time tying into the wolf slash dogs. Okay, so there's some kind of rainbow and the wolves and the dogs. Are we in Rome? <laughs> Are we in Rome? And maybe we're in Rome. Maybe we're in Rome. What what do you what what do you see there that makes you think it might be Rome? Well, just the wolves made me think of Romulus and re, in the um, oh, hole. Oh right, Ma Romulus. Right, me too. It makes me think of that. So this could be wrong. Okay, good job. So now I'm going to tell you what this is. Can I turn the lights back on? You can turn the lights back on. It's probably none of that. <laughs> so, yes, it is a selfie. Yes, it is a selfie. So this is my son, Kyle. Oh. And his partner, Jamal. And Kyle works for Human Rights Watch. And he just got back from this place where there is this wall in my book, Talking Walls. Ooh. So he went there and he took a picture. And he said, Mom, aren't I cool? I'm sending you a picture. A selfie. So um, these are dogs. These are Akita dogs. Oh, Akita. Uh, yes, these are Akita. So this yeah. is the dog Hotchko. Do you know oh, about the Hotchko yes. story? Yeah. So and um, so this is in a subway station in Tokyo. Oh. So in <laughs> in in my in Talking Walls, and not only me. There is this great story about this dog named Hotchko, the loyal dog story. And if you don't know the story, Hotchko, so a Hotchko is, is an Akita. And Akitas are very loyal dogs. So um, Hotchko is owned by a professor. And they went to the train, this train station every day. And then oh, the professor the died. Mm -hmm. And then for nine years, um, after the professor died, Hotchko went every day. Here it is. So this is it in the book. And that's mm. every day. And then the people in the community took care of Hotchko. And after Hotchko died, to say thank you for his loyalty, they put a oh. mural up uh -huh. and a statue in the front, which Kyle sent me a statue, but I don't care that much about statues. So, um, but since the book, our book has come out, Somebody wrote a children's book just about Hachiko, oh. the dog that waits, and Hachiko, oh, Hachiko and the Hachiko waits. So these are in a lot of school libraries. So one thing I really try to do when I work in schools is my book is just to launch a discovery. And if you want to know more about Hachiko, go read this book or whatever else you'd like to know about Hachiko. Our dog is named Hachi after Hachiko. He's a part of Kita. Really? I didn't, we didn't name him. Um, the person who fostered him named him. Yeah. Really? He, yeah, he's a rescue. So he's named after this dog. Do you read him these books? No. I didn't know about those books. Now, you know. <laughs> now, now that I do know about those books. <laughs> now you can read it to him. <laughs> oh, he would like those books? You could read them right to Hotchko. Interesting. Yeah, so that's, that's, uh, so this, this is another expansion of, so this, I show this to kids a lot. Usually I do it in the other order, but we'll do it in this order. So um, this is obviously a photograph that I found, but this is also somehow connected to talking walls. So let's look at that, this. So what's going on in this picture? So we won't do the parent share, just tell me. You know about parent share. What's going on in this picture? Mm -hmm. I think. 
I think it looks like um, the dog is the um, topic, and there's people there that have uh, hands on the dog, so there's either the dog is getting something being taken care of. So there's a dog. The dog is probably being taken care of. He seems to be the subject of the picture because mm -hmm. so, there's actually hands on the dog and the dog's being taken care of. I feel like she's hugging him. So With we... sense of closeness. <clears throat> so the dog is being hugged. What do you see that makes you think the dog's being hugged? She's got her arms around him. The way she has, she's cradling him or she's putting her arms around him or maybe giving him a little hug. Now, I'm going to just stop because this is a workshop. One thing this is really good about is increasing vocabulary because you said put their arms around and I just right away went to cradling, hugging. Mm -hmm. So you can just, because I'm paraphrasing, I can expand the vocabulary mm -hmm. and it's a great way to introduce a bigger piece of vocabulary. So we have some, somebody's taking care of the dog. The dog is being hugged or cradled a little. We've got some hands. So, but it looks like this lady is taking care of this dog and somebody is taking care of this dog. So we have a dog and a lady. So um, anything else? What else is going on in the picture? I, I think it's from an earlier time. Do you think it's from, what do you see that makes you say that? A hat and so, her dress. So the hat and the dress tell you it's from an earlier time. Even his collar. And, oh, even the dog collar looks like an earlier time. So this picture was probably taken a while ago or a long time ago. It looks, um, it looks almost like it's in a church with stained glass window. Behind. Yes, this sort of looks like it could be in a church in a stained glass window. This was taken a while ago because of the way the woman has the hat and the dress. It's not a fashion of today. It's a fashion of yesterday. And she's holding this lovely dog. And so um, is there anything else that we have not talked about? I'm thinking that it's possible that, that she's keeping the dog in this position, that, that um, the dog might be on some kind of a display, like a competition or you know, like, like, like she may be the trainer of the dog. Right, so she could be the trainer of the dog. Okay. The dog could be on display. I just noticed a chain, though. Why is it? It's a chain. Oh, and she has a chain. No, down the side. On oh, the side chained? of the dog. Oh, yeah. So now there's a chain down the side yeah, of the dog. So it kind of takes away from the huggy feeling. It takes away from the huggy thing. Okay, thank you for sharing. You're very good. That's very good stories. You're all very good storytellers. So this is an Akita. So Akitas, for a very long time, only lived in Japan. And this is the woman who brought the first Akita to the United States. And she was very, very famous. We only know a lot about her as a child. We don't know a lot about her as a grown up because she was an outspoken socialist. Mm. And we never followed her life. But we followed her a lot because she could spell the word water into her hand with her teacher. Oh, Helen, Helen Keller? This is Helen Keller. Oh. <laughs> so Helen Keller traveled to 35 countries during her adulthood. Oh and she was a lecturer for all kinds of reasons, and she was a feminist. And mm -hmm. so, so did she keep the dog? Yes, yes. She okay, kept. that's the important part. Did so she, she the went to Japan in 19, she went to Japan, Hachiko died in like 19, in the 30s. She went to Japan right after, she had heard of the story, and she was, I, I am, she was treated very nicely in Japan. Maybe it was a prince of Japan or somebody, and they said, well, so they gave her an Akita for a gift. The, the Akita went home and I don't know what happened to him, but he didn't make it. So they sent her another one whose name was Gogo, -Go, and who spent the rest of his life with her, um, with Helen Keller. And that's how the Akita first got to the, how people first heard of the Akita. So it's interesting when I was doing, um, doing this book right before they were post, supposed to publish it. Now remember, I don't speak a word of Korean, but Annie, the illustrator I work with, grew up in Korea. Ah. So she speaks a lot of Korean. Um, right when they were gonna put the book to press or to print, they called me, or I don't know what they did, and they said, you know, they called them chapters. We are going to take chapter 15 out of the book. It doesn't really fit 
in our book. It's a singular story. Now you know Korea and Japan have had a bad history, mm -hmm. a very bad history. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't understand all their bad history, but it hasn't been great and they, they're not friends or they're not good friends. So I said, well, that's funny. Nelson Mandela is a singular story. I guess you got to take him out too. <laughs> Somebody out. why are you taking him out? Because I wanted to hear why they were taking him out. And I, I sort of knew, and I told Annie, the book isn't going to go to print. Because part of the reasons we write this is to, for the future. So countries have had struggles and countries have had huge problems and I, I understand but until we tell each other stories, we're always going to have trouble. So then they said to me, well, Helen, what, what about Helen Keller? Was she on a peace mission? I don't know what kind of mission Helen Keller, yes, yeah, she was on a peace mission. <laughs> and I looked it up, and when she went to Japan, she also went to Korea at the same time. She traveled a lot. She was an ex it, it is extraordinary to think there's five million books about her. This is one of my favorites, and I show kids as a child. Mm -hmm. And this one actually does a little, little better and it shows her as a grown-up. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is, you know, she was very outspoken and she wanted certain things for the world. She was very, and she wanted certain things for the world and she told people. Well, she signed people. Um, so finally the Korean publishing company editors said, okay, we'll include it in the book. I said, yes, you will, thank you. Because I was really gonna pull it. When I was a, young, a much younger and a new author, I was always so excited about whatever people, yeah, you can have those rights, yeah, oh, that is so cool. But I'm, I'm very old fart now. <laughs> and things aren't as cool for me. So luckily we stuck to our guns, because I think that's the only way we're gonna improve or get better, is listen to everybody's stories. And it was about a dog. You know, it's a happy little story, and it's about friendship. But I love this. I love the Helen Keller, and grown-ups are just as surprised as children. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think you, you're more surprised because you sort of get the sense of time more than kids do. For them, it's just another, it's another cute story. So I don't know if that's Go-Go or... So it's in, in the Talking Walls compendium, and now that you all have books, um, it's in, we actually added, let's see. The Akita dog is a national treasure in Japan, a symbol of good health and loyalty. It was originally bred as a hunting dog in the mountains of northern Japan. During a speaking tour in Japan in 1937, Helen Keller was given an Akita puppy that traveled back to the USA, but died a few months later from distemper. In 1939, a 100-pound Akita arrived in New York City, mm -hmm. a gift from Japan to fill the void. Nicknamed Gogo, -Go, the dog lived with her for many years. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, you can see lots of pictures. Now if you see her, she's probably with her dog, and that's probably why there's a chain, because she was blind. Yeah, that <laughs> right? makes sense. Makes sense, and this is probably before they had the vests and everything mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. dog w working. And I don't know if he was trained at all, hmm. but I know they were very loyal dogs. So mm -hmm. I just think that's a very cool story. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have any questions about this strategy? Do you see any way that you would use it anywhere? Okay, so tell me. I have three grandchildren who are almost five, almost three, and almost two. And this is a great opportunity to talk about not only books, but they come to my cabin in the remote mountains of Rangeley, right. and what a great thing to ask them what's going on. Right. And, they and, and tell me and more. Just tell me more. And, and why do you, and what, what do you see that makes you yeah. say that? It just builds vocabulary. And yeah, just, it does. And it helps them understand and relate what they see and what's in their world around them, and they can take it back and tell their friends <coughs> and their teachers. And yeah, their yeah. And it works, I've, I've done workshops as low as kindergarten, I mean, you really gotta do it quickly. <laughs> but they, they get it, kindergarten, because there's so many pictures in their lives, and it, it, works, it works through. Well, that's how they get most of their information. Right, by, you know, by images. By images, right. right. So. Anybody else have any other use for this? Is it, can you see using it, yes? I'll use it in my creative art and development class, um, because we talk about <laughs> art and differences and yeah creativity yeah i think with the i think for it to really work so 
this is true confessions. And I, I go into a lot of schools and everybody seems really interested in using it and I don't know if anybody does because it takes practice. You have to give the teachers like a day, like I'm, you're pra we're gonna keep practicing. But before you are comfortable getting up here and doing what I do, that would be your job as the teacher or the librarian. And it, it's easier if you're just doing it with one person. But it took me a while. I mean, I went to two days of training and I've worked a lot in the Portland schools doing this. Um, and now it just comes to me second nature. But I think one of the most powerful parts um, and one of the most powerful parts are the, what your job is as a facilitator. So um, we're gonna, yeah, so, so that's just what I'm gonna say for right now. So, so Margie, I have a question. Um, when you talk about your students, when you talk about using this with students, what is the youngest age group that? I've, been, I've done it with Penny since she could listen okay. to me. Okay. I mean, she doesn't know I'm doing it, mm -hmm. and so I, I have a, a niece that has fragile X, mm -hmm. which is a chromosome. She doesn't have Down syndrome, but it's somewhat close. So it is an IQ, whatever. And so she really struggles la linguistically. And so she was visiting last year, and I was doing it a lot, and she loved it. And she goes, Aunt Margie, this is so much fun. I've, I've never heard so many questions. You are so curious. <laughs> but she kept talking to me. What, what's going on in this picture? And you don't have to do it all. You can start with just what's going on in this picture and you paraphrase. Then when you get comfortable, what do you see that makes you say that? What I really love about the second one is that when you see their little brains ticking. Oh, I said that. What do you see that makes you say that? And I'm. I'm I'm gonna do, um, so, and, and then what else do you see is really important because they might have left out an imp the whole part of the image that they need to look at. So, um, and I don't know how these people develop this three question protocol, but I've been in education a really long time and I've tried a lot. I, I went through a notebook the other week and I thought, oh, I can't believe I used to do that. Oh, I can't believe I used to do that. And it was all about how to ask questions, the Bloom's taxonomy, critical thinking, question cubes, question blocks. And I never stuck to it, but this one is, this is, I think this is a keeper. So, um, and you can get a lot done in a very short period of time. So right now we've only done, um, well, I did read a little to you. But the listening part and the speaking part, and then I always say to them, so when we're done, or when I'm done, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the story, but you can go read the rest. And if you really like it, there's probably 10 other books about this. So I really encourage the discovery beyond the little things that I wrote. So that also makes it, and it's fun. You know, there's, I know I'm being videoed, so don't show this to people. <laughs> that aren't fans of change. <laughs> but a lot of education is so not fun. And if you have fun, learning has to be fun. There's nothing wrong with having a little fun when you're learning. And you know who really, kids really like this. Most kids. I've worked with special ed kids and I work a lot, I mean my background is ELL so I've done this a lot with ELL kids. But because there's that little bit of like, mm, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think I'm right, and she's gonna tell me the right answer soon, and I, I think I'm right, boys love it. Because <laughs> it's a little bit, they think it's a competition. It really isn't, because they don't know the answer. But I had middle school kids at the Reiki school, no, King Middle School, and they were a riot. They were absolutely sure, wherever I, it was the Taos Pueblo. I know that's in Iraq. My friends are from Iraq. They told me their houses look just like that. Mm -hmm. And what else do you see that makes you think it's Iraq? Well, Iraq is in the desert, and I know that's the desert, and I'm absolutely sure. And I said, you probably need to say, I think. I think, but I know it's right. And when I told him it was in the United States, I thought he was gonna pass out. Show me that book, I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps a little bit with the tedium of, and you know, we're, we're really into teaching informational text. It used to be called nonfiction. But I'm not sure we really know how to do it. So, um, 
This is just an easy, fun way to get to do it. Okay, let's do another one. I have lots. <laughs> and the, the key is, um, the more you do it, and you know, you are all welcome to, um, you know, add, you know, you can just, you can add your own, this is the way I do it, it's so fluid, you could do it your own way if you wanted to. Okay, so this is an image that I, we're going to share, so look at the whole image, yeah, and turn, and I want you to pair and share, because I, I want you to really think about, so what's going on in this picture? I think I see someone who's very proud of receiving some kind of an award. Yeah, mm -hmm. and probably, a, and a, I don't immediately think of Africa because of the dress. Mm -hmm. Not because he's black, but because of the garments he's wearing. Colors. Yeah, he's clearly proud. Mm -hmm. Okay, I heard lots of things, so let's start. And you can start with, I think. So what's going on in this picture? Somebody want to start? I think. I think this man is showing pride at receiving some kind of an award. Okay, so we have a man that's showing pride because he receives some kind of award. So what do you see in this picture that makes you think he's proud? The way he's displaying the Award. award. The way he's displaying the word, he's holding his award. The what else? On expression. His face. So he has this expression on his face that just looks like he's proud. Mm -hmm. So we have a proud man, I think, holding some kind of award. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else is going on in the picture? Mm -hmm. I think he's dressed for some type of occasion. Um, looks like something ceremonial <coughs> or, or at least. Um, Special. Yeah, so he's dressed, he's got some, maybe some special clothes on, he's looking very proud and he's holding some kind of award, and so he got dressed up, some, he looks like he's somewhat dressed up to get his award. Okay, is any, what else is going on in this picture, anything else? I immediately think of Afri some sort of African country simply because of the garb. So you think perhaps he's from an African country, because he's wearing some kind of garb. So what makes you think this is Africa because of the garb? The patterns, the style. Because there's a certain style, a certain pattern that reminds you of a country in Africa. So, so far, we have a very proud man, perhaps holding a prize. He seems very dressed up. And perhaps he's from, from some country in Africa because he is Wearing clothes that reminds us of a style in Africa. This is a big story you're making. He's Good. clutching it. He's not going to let that award go. <laughs> so he's yeah. actually clutching this big award. Yep. So he's holding on to it tight, and he's clutching it <clears throat> with great pride in his face, dressed up, probably maybe from some country in Africa. So is there anything that we have not talked about yet? The buildings in the back. It's city. Oh, there's buildings in the back, so this could be some kind of city, because there's buildings in the back. Or I think it looks like some sort of a screen, maybe just some sort of divider. It doesn't look like a building. Maybe it's just the way I'm looking. Or he could so be. It could be just a sort of a screen or a divider for the picture. So, but we know that he's well. We think he's clutching an award. We think he's from a country in Africa. We think he's very proud because he has a proud expression on his face and he's dressed up because he's probably getting a prize for something. So thank you for sharing. Yes, you're all close. You could write the story yourself. <laughs> so um, every year in April, since 1990, um, a family in California in 1990 started an award and it's called the Goldman Environmental Prize. And every year they give it to one person from each continent um, to thank them for the grassroots effort to doing something to make the world a better place. And my focus is mostly on the African continent because I wrote Africa is not a country and so much that comes out of Africa is negative that I'm always looking for positive stories so keep, people can relate 
to um, just start relating on a personal level through the human lens instead of like, oh, the, and we, it doesn't help that we have leaders calling them that they're from shithole nations. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help my cause at all. So um, yeah. it makes me want to work harder. So this is the continent of Africa's 2019 recipient. Mm -hmm. So you're correct. He is from Liberia and his name is Alfred, I have it right here. He just got the award. I mean, not like I know him. Alfred Brunel, he's a lawyer. And he, um, this is interesting, oops, oops. He has saved a lot of the forests in Liberia from foreign intervention to grow what we want, not what the Liberians need. So he's an activist. The, this is, I, I read about this. Helen Sirloff Johnson, who was the first woman president of Liberia, um, sold 30% of the forest to foreign intervention, foreign companies, which is happening all over the world, but mostly on the African continent. As we run out of resources ourselves, we think we can get them from them. So he's worked really hard. He actually has to live in exile now. So he lives in Boston, he works at Northeastern University. But um, he was, he just got the award. So they've been giving the award to someone on the African continent since 1990. And I, <clears throat> I often get in touch with them, because I said, look, all right, I've written this book called Africa's Not a Country. We don't have enough good news coming out of Africa. This would be fabulous if you could create a curriculum around these, these people from all over your continent that have such happy stories. We, dear lady, thank you, we don't do curriculum. But I, I'm surprised that people haven't, um, so one person who did win in 1990, and it, it, it's a, I don't, let me see if I have her picture. So where is the picture taken, is that Boston? I don't know if it was taken in Liberia. It, you know what, I think it, they took it after he won, okay. and the, um, the ceremonies in California. So I don't know. Um, Where was I don't know exactly, but let me see if I can find this. Hers. Hers. So this is just because I, I think if not me, so don't say, Margie, you should do this because I'm not. I'm telling you somebody else should do it. Just give this idea to somebody else and make them do it because I'm not doing it. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a really good idea. But I don't think I have a picture of her. So, in 1990, a woman named Wangari Matai, she got the Goldman Award, and she also got the Nobel Peace Prize. She was the first one to get it for the environment. And she was the woman from Kenya who did the trees, the tree lady. So, she, people have loved her so much. There's five picture books about her. Five, Wangari Maathai, Planting Trees, Loving Trees, Seeds of Change, Planting the Trees of Kenya, and Mama Mita. So there's five picture books about one woman, all for American children, which I'm so thrilled. But how about all the other people that have won the Goldman? They, they, somebody could write a picture book about this guy. They, people have won from Ghana, from Mozambique. They win for working for water, saving animals, clean air. And then the, um, the American who won this year was a woman. What did she do? Something that way out west, she stopped one of those pipelines. But we need to know about these people. Even if people disagree with their shenanigans, we need to know that these people exist. So every year when, um, the Goldman Prize is announced. I, I, I congratulate the person on my blog. That probably doesn't do much, but I, when I go into classrooms, I tell teachers, if you're gonna do a research project on Africa, do the Goldman Environmental Prize. They have an incredible website. They introduce you to each of the winners, and they tell you who they are and what country they're from. They have great pictures of them. They have a video of them getting their award. I, I don't even think they get a lot of money. They get some, and most of them just put it back. Um, they just put it back into their, um, 
been into their work. I don't think they, they don't go on big vacations. Like I was driving in here, some guy from California, he spent a lot of money on vacation, one of our Congress people. But we won't talk about him right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, there. Okay. So, when I do this in classrooms, so, you know, I'm, an, I'm invited to schools, I, I'm an author, so they invite me. And I tell them I'll do four one hour workshops a day. And I'd like to work with a grade level. And I'll only do two classrooms at a time. So I will not do more than 35 or 40 kids. Because you could see you can't do it with more than 40. Can you do a whole school assembly? No. Why not? This is all I do. I do just this. If you don't want me, go hire somebody else. So ideally, I like one classroom, 20 kids. And because it's really easy, to, I'm pretty good at managing, but I didn't, I, I went somewhere and they misunderstood me and they gave me 50 kids. You can do it with 50 kids or 50 people, but you're going to get a lot more out of it if you have a smaller group and everybody participates. And even the shyest, um, even the shyest kids who don't usually speak, and I've been in schools <coughs> where teachers come up to me and they said, you, you know, a kid, um, so yeah, this is, I'm gonna just tell you this a little bit. So this was with, I mean, I wasn't astonished. The teachers were astonished and I said, good, we'll keep up the good work, have them talk more. So I showed little kids, so I had the pre-K and the kindergarten and, and they misunderstood me and they gave me 100 kids. And I said, I'm just gonna do it, Margie. So I just did it. So, <laughs> but I altered it, so we did this little, this was in Welcoming Babies, the end papers. Mm -hmm. So I kept asking them, I asked them, how are these babies feeling? And we got to the point, so there was a little kid, he must have been, he had a one-on-one -on -one adult with them. They had him in a special chair, and I guess they thought he was acting ridiculous. But anyway, I kept calling on him. And so we got to, we got to the one where somebody's smiling, and I said, well, what do you see that makes you say that, that baby's smiling? So most of them just said, I told you he's just smiling, therefore. I told you they're just smiling. And I said, do you see anything that tells you they're smiling? They're smiling, you know, they're just smiling. So the, the naughty boy in the chair with the one-on-one -on -one adult said, oh, I know exactly what you're asking me. They're smiling because you know what? They're, they're crinkling up their cheek like this, and that's a smile. I thought the teachers were going to fall off their chair. They didn't even know he was capable of thinking that way. And I said, well, just do this exercise with him a few times a day. You know, they said, I didn't even know he had that in him. Now, the, I guarantee you the school never did it, because they're so busy doing other things. Mm -hmm. But at least I introduced it to them. And I said, the only way you're going to really do this is you have to bring me or someone else back and you have to practice it with me because you're not going to go off and do this. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, one person came up to me and said, everyone in this school needs to do this once a day. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you can do it once a day. Like, you know, silent reading. They said every kid should be doing this. And in Boston, the Fine Arts Museum, they have nine schools in Boston where they go in and train kids in this and then they bring them to the museum. But they don't do the academic part. They just do the I love art part. So this does work with, you just, you can adjust it for the smaller groups. Is that your daughter? The one oh, one of them's my daughter. That's my son, and that's my daughter. <laughs> yes, but she said, Mom, tell people that was me. That's so much cuter. <laughs> I said, this is a nonfiction book, I can't. <laughs> Okay, so this, let's, let's try, this one has a lot going on. So this is from Talking Walls. Um, and this is the only, um, this is the only, they're called double page spreads. This is the only one we actually have two countries going on. We have two countries in this story oh. for a reason. So to give you, sometimes I tell people that, sometimes I don't. But a lot's going on in this picture. So um, what's going on in this picture? Tell, turn and tell people for a minute. 
because there's a lot going on. I think. I think I see on the right bottom section people, like like a gathering, like a huge. Yeah, it's like night and day. Yeah, like one is dark, night and one is light. Small people on the right. Yeah. She's kind of bridging the gap. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then you got the young person on the left running towards something, and then you get someone who the seat. Okay, I hear some very good stories. Who wants to start? I think. So this is from Talking Walls, and this has two countries. So what do people think? I think. I think the girl in the yellow dress is on her way to get. So we have a girl in a yellow dress on her way to get water. What do you see in that picture that makes you think she's getting water? She's carrying a jug. I think it's empty. It doesn't appear to be heavy in her hand. Right, so she's the jug appears heavy, but not so heavy that So this is a girl in a yellow dress who might be going to get water because her jug or is, looks empty because it doesn't look like it's heavy. So we've started the story. What else is going on in the picture? Day and night. So what about day and night? Tell me a story. Well, What's happening? I think. <laughs> well, I think the left side is day, the right side is night. So I don't know if that's possibly representing the two different countries. So there could be there. You know, there's two different countries. So this is night and this is day. So maybe this is one country and maybe this is the second country. Yeah. And we have a girl who's have, probably going to get water with her em empty vessel or pot. And somehow she's bridging the gap because she's right in the middle. And somehow she could be bridging the gap. She I think I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I think they're going to prayer. Is who's going to prayer? The always, that's well, it looks like men. <laughs> um, so, so we think perhaps they're going to prayer. What do you see in that picture that makes you think they're praying? We were in Turkey during Ramadan, and they all, it was just masses of people that came together, um, and they went into mosques. Um, so this reminds her of when she went to Turkey. There were lots of people during Ramadan who were in large crowds, and they went to pray, and they sort of looked like this. So we have two countries. This is the nighttime country. This is the daytime country. This girl lives in one of them. She might be going to get water. And now we have a crowd or a group of people that may be going to pray, because it reminds her of Ramadan in Turkey. <coughs> OK, what else is going on in the picture? What else do you see that we haven't talked about? I see art on so, the wall. So we see art on the wall. What, what, what do you see that makes you say that's art? Um, the colors, the designs. OK, so um, we have colors and designs on the wall this wall, then we have the girl getting water, and we have this group of people praying, and we have nighttime, and we have daytime. Is there anything? Almost we... more than art, like a story. So maybe this wall is telling a story. So we have a story wall. And it's obviously modern times, because we have an airplane on that wall. So maybe this is modern times, because we have an airplane on the wall. So this could be now. This, this place in the daytime could be now. This could be a crowd of people. This could be nighttime. This could be the girl. Okay, have we seen every, have we talked about everything? Is there anything mm -hmm. else in the like, picture? We're not, I haven't talked about the young boy that's running away in that so side. So we see a boy running away. The other side. A boy running and away. And a person on a donkey riding And we have us. this person, a herder, taking care of his goats or donkeys or whatever you want to think they are. And we talked all about this, and we talked about this, and we talked about this. Have we talked about everything? Well, um, I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's some kind of uh, rock wall yeah, in the background. Of the wall. Back here? Yeah. Um, so no, no. Middle. Back. In the middle. Oh, here. This might be a rock wall. Right. That separates. OK, you guys did a good job. So you're close. You're, these are two countries. You're correct. This is Egypt. And this is one of the holiest places in the world for the faith of Islam. And this is Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And this is during the Hajj. So if you practice this faith once in your lifetime, you hope to go to Mecca. And there's, 
think there's seven rituals when you get there. Um, one of the first ones is you're, this is a group of um, pilgrims dressed in white, and they walk around the Kaaba seven times praying. And that's, there's a lot of them. And this little girl is, lives in Egypt, and she's daydreaming, and she's hoped someday to go to the Hajj. And in Egypt, when people come back from the Hajj, they paint their walls of their homes to tell people they've been there. So it's right, it's a story. So you guys got it, pretty much. And um, Ramadan, I mean, Ramadan just ended June 6th, and I think the Hajj is in September. So it's closely related because it's all on a lunar calendar. And there's a brand new, well, I think in the last two years, and it's really important. We have these books in our libraries and in our schools, and we use them because there's so, many, there's so much misconception about people um, who follow any faith, but especially this faith. So this is called Going to Mecca. And I tell, it's, um, the Kaaba's in here, and the crowds of people are in here, but the, the, the artists paints them very differently than Annie. Mm -hmm. So they can see that there's a lot of differences. So if, you, if I work in Portland or Lewiston where there's large populations of kids who practice this faith, they have stories about people who have been to the Hajj or, or been, um, who want to go there someday. Um, it's very expensive and you don't have to go if you can't afford it. So there's other things you're supposed to do like pray five times a day. The fasting is really important. Um, this is important, but it's really expensive to go to Saudi Arabia. So I'm going to tell you a little story. When um, in the 2016, is that when we got our new president? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I went into a school in um, very close by here, because it has much to do with Central Maine. I'm not going to name the school, but very close by. I went into fourth grade. Um, and it was January 2016, probably March of 2016. So I, um, I put this up as fourth grade. And we did, this wasn't the first one, so we had done several. And I said, what's going on in this picture? I heard all the little gabbing. And um, a kid raised their hand and said, um, I mean, he really said this. I thought the poor young teacher was just going to fall off the chair. But I, I think I handled it well. I think this is the KKK. Mm -hmm. And I, he mm -hmm. said, yeah, they wear white robes. There they are. Mm -hmm. This is the KKK. And they're, they're, they're having a meeting. And I said, OK, Margie, just do the protocol. Mm -hmm. what, do you th what, what, do you th what do you see that m makes you think it's the KKK? Well, I've heard they're like ghosts in white. And they have secret meetings. And there they are. They're having a secret meeting. And you know, they don't like black people and they don't like lots of different kinds of people. And I didn't repeat that, but I did repeat. And I said, and I just repeated and I said right away, what else is going on in the picture? So a multiracial kid stood up and he said, I can understand why he thinks it's the KKK. I know about the KKK too. And I'm like, you're all nine years old. Where did you learn about the KKK? But you'll get it in a minute. But I know that's not the KKK. And I'm, I go, well, what, do you see? what do you see in the picture that makes you think it's not the KKK? Will you see that girl's face? That's a brown girl. And they would never invite brown people to KKK meetings because they don't like them. So, <laughs> so well, I got that. That was, that was, I said, thank you for sharing. Let's talk about what you see. And then we switched it right away. So, um, and then I told him the real story that I didn't say it's not the KKK, and I didn't repeat it a million times, but I honored what they thought. Um, and I did the whole, this is Mecca, and I showed them the book, and you know, and um, because it's right around here. I don't know if we had a lot of new Mainers yet, but they were coming. So they had seen women in hijabs, and they sort of knew that not everybody looked like them, because they had a lot of kids in their class that looked a little differently than them. So, <clears throat> so I left, I went home, and I was like asking people, like, what the hell? Why would they know about the KKK? They are fourth graders, and they live in central Maine. 
Do you remember what happened in March of 2016 in, in right up here on, up in near St. Augustine and in oh. the poor communities? Yes, yeah, somebody like painted a sign. Or no, they put leaflets in people's mailbox. Oh, KKK oh, leaflets. Right, right. They it's put leaflets normal. in their kids' mailbox, and it's interesting because these kids were from that town, hmm. and their parents were probably trying to explain to them what the KKK was, and must have told them they're ghosts who were white, and I don't know what else they told them, but that that's the story I got. So. Is that a good thing, or is that just makes people so crazy, Margie should never go into a school again? <laughs> but my opinion, not only me, my opinion is, unless we have a place for children to have these kind of conversations, and not only about Mecca, but anything going on in their life, how are they gonna be healthy children? We have to put conversation back into our lives. And because of social media and all the other things going on in lives, the studies sadly are saying vocabulary development is down, long conversations are down, storytelling is down, because when everybody gets all upset and worried and you're nervous or you're tired, you just get plugged in. And they've already seen a huge change. Mm -hmm. And I'm just doing my little bit to turn it around. And I, I just loved that day. I mean, I didn't love it like, oh my gosh, they talked about the KKK. But, but I love that I had a, pro, a safe place for them to go, a safe place. So I've been doing this work for a really long time and especially with Africa is not a country. You know, kids have said some pretty ridiculous things, mostly out of ignorance. And I just wish I had had this protocol to, to go back to the picture with, tell me what you think. And, very often, the second question, tell me why, what, um, oh, I know. I put a picture up from Africa in our country and they kept trying to tell, and I forget which one it was, but the people did not look poor at all. But their, their perception is anybody who's brown not like them is poor because they're human and poor people aren't human. That's what we teach people inadvertently. So I put it up and they're middle schoolers. Well, what do you see in that picture that makes them look poor? And they're like, nothing. They caught themselves. They caught themselves. I gave them permission to catch themselves. I didn't have to say, well, that's the stupidest thing you've ever said. And that's what we would, no, I mean, I'd never really say that to a kid. But in the past, I really didn't have, um, I didn't have a tool to just go back to the image and say, well, tell me. Tell me what in there that makes you think they look poor. And he said, well, they don't really look poor at all. It's just that's what comes to their head. And I think if we start this young and often, um, it will just be a happier world because we have a place to do this. And people, I think one reason schools are hesitant to do this is they're not sure what the kid's going to say. And teachers mm -hmm. like to be in control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. We do. We like to be in control. We like to be in control of our classrooms, and this takes up some time, but it really doesn't take up that much time. It's pretty quick. So I just wanted to share. And this is the only, so when I've trained teachers, they're, what happens if they say something ridiculous or inappropriate? I said, well, I've been doing this for four years now, and I've only had two kids, and I don't consider this inappropriate. I consider this learning. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not their fault somebody put KKK flyers in their mailbox and that a lot of people applauded it. I mean, it's, it, they're probably very confused. And you know, that was pretty, I mean, that was pretty quick. That was like, that could be the KKK. And I love the multiracial kid. They're not, that's not the KKK, they hate that girl. And he's like, okay, okay. And they, they had the conversation and all I did was facilitate it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so often I show three, so I show three and I repeat them all. And so we have maybe, depending on, and if they have a question, some kids really want to know how I write the book and how I did the research, so I do that. And then um, we, we repeat, we do choral reading where we all tell the story together. So I would say, so, um, and they just love this because they all know it. 
and they haven't even read the book. So just imagine when they go to read, they're going to be so excited because they're already so smart from doing this exercise. So I'll say, okay, let's do this all together. So this is in the country of Egypt, Egypt and this is in Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia, and these people are, I mean, I've only told you this two once. They're walking around the building, the building seven times, and they love it. They love it. So we do that, and then um, I ask them to write. And these are some writing samples um, that are just amazing how much they can write after I've only talked to them. I mean, we do three in an hour, and then they write. And then they write these amazing stories because they, they feel invested. And they haven't, the funny thing is they haven't opened my book yet. Just imagine after they opened the book and they read the text, they could even write more. So um, I did this a few summers ago in New York City for, so New York City, New York City tries to educate more people than live in the state of Maine every day. They try to educate a million kids a day. That's a lot of people. They put Africans in our country in the third grade curriculum a few years ago. They, they stopped doing social studies for a while. I don't know why. And then they put it in. So I was asked to come and so I had teachers from all the bor boroughs and I was the only white person in the room doing this workshop. And they all had different reasons why they thought this was so important. But mostly it was about getting conversation back into the classroom. But what they couldn't believe is how strong the writing was. And a lot of them, I had to give them my samples. Because they said, can I take this because no one's going to believe me. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you can take it. And they said, not only that, we could do this tomorrow if we had to. <coughs> I said, yeah, you could do it tomorrow if you had to. You can do it right now if you had to. So, um, so that, that's why I added the writing piece, because people said writing's, you know, kids hate writing, and blah, blah, writing stinks, and whatever. But, um, but none of that is true, because, you know, and maybe kids are faking it because I'm a visitor, <laughs> but um, I don't think so, because if you read this writing, um, and they sit down and they just write, could you give them a choice, they can choose, one of the, through the one, the story that not you like, I don't like it, and your favorite, the story that today that you thought was the coolest. Could you rewrite it for me? And then I said, when I leave, you could open my book and read what I wrote and compare and see how close we are to their stories. Because I, I don't say in my story is so much better. I just say we can compare. So that's another way of doing it. Any questions, thoughts, anything else you want to know? Could you read us one of them? I mean, I oh, yeah, you want to hear them? Mm -hmm. OK. So this, so I, let's see. Oh, yeah. So this is about Wangari Matai. So I pretty much did the, well, you saw the picture of the Liberian guy, but it was a picture of her holding a tree in a dress, getting an award. She looked very proud. So Goldman must have all this, the same photographer. <laughs> so um, with Wangari Matai, because Let's see, trees are about a half a mile away from, my, oh, so, oh, I am, let's see, because they are, no, we don't do Mangari Matai. It's a <laughs> book that, oh, this is a great one. So in, in Talking Walls is Great Zimbabwe, and Mofaro's Beautiful Daughters is set in Great Zimbabwe. So I show them the walls. Zimbabwe has walls that are a mystery. It's in the book, Mofaro's Beautiful Daughters. It's really old. The walls have moss, and there are trees that are curving. That's really good writing. And this is a, a, this is a great school on the coast. And I, I only this and these are the little kids. These are the little kids. Um, so and then the kids that oh this is the Korean wall. In Korea, there's a wall that families and friends go to and get a ribbon so they can. They can write for their families and stuff like that. It separates North Korea and South Korea. And that's without reading mm. a word, mm. because mm. we don't read Korean. In Korea, there is a wall. The people and their family put ribbons on the border wall. For one day, Korea can be one. Mm. Aren't these cute? Yeah. Yep. I know that. 
Now, I know that in Korea there's a wall that separates North Korea and South Korea. I know that families come from a, a side of the wall and they set, get a ribbon and they write hopes and dreams so they can come as one country. Mm. And that's all, yep, isn't that amazing? And this is, and we did two other walls. And this is in one hour. So you do, you introduce, you do three walls, you do the choral reading, and then you have them write, and then you clap, and then you go to another room, and I do it three times, and then I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. I used to do five workshops, but ah, not anymore. Because this, I really, I, you know, you really, as my job, is you really have to pay attention to what everything, everybody's saying, mm -hmm. and figure out when to stop, and figure out when to ne ask the next question. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Does anybody want to try it? Does anybody else want to get up here and try it, to facilitate it, or do you just want to keep practicing? Okay, well, I didn't hear much. <laughs> right. I'd like to try it, but I don't want to do the only one. <laughs> Go you, for you it. You can try it. it. That's why we're here. Go for it. All right, let me get one. So, why don't we do... Go easy on her, Margie. Oh, I'm going to go easy. <laughs> Because I won't have the background. <laughs> no, you don't have the advantage. background, but then you know what? You just do the first part, and then I'll take over and tell the real story. Okay. All right? Because the first part, you don't know, you, you don't have to know anything. You just repeat what everybody says, <laughs> and you keep asking those three questions. So, what's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? What else do you see? And then, uh, and then you can say thank you very much, and I will take over. Okay. <laughs> what do you see in this picture? What's going on in this picture? But I already blew it. That's okay. It has to be going on because you start a narrative. Okay. What's going on in this picture? Do you want to turn to each other and talk? Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I was interested in your. I know. Answers. I know. I know. But you know, you got to do four of these in an hour. Okay. 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 So, what's going on in this picture? Okay. I'm sorry. What? What's going on in this picture? Oh, um, uh, she, I think that uh, they seem to be working on some type of a, a project where they're creating, creating something. What do you see that makes you say that? Um, it looks like the woman is uh, doing something to the flower, like painting it or etching or doing something. And uh, perhaps there there are family members, and the little girl is also like looking over her shoulder to see who might be watching them. Okay, now repeat everything she said. Oh my. That's what you, okay. she, you think. <laughs> you, you think that the, that the woman may be painting um, a picture and um, she is, I was listening to you, but I don't remember. Right. Um, and, and the little girl practice. Is, looking, is looking over her shoulder to see um, if somebody is watching her. And did you say there might be some religious significance? Relation. Their relatives. <laughs> Their relatives. Okay, good. Okay, that's okay. I, th I think they're from two different generations, in that she's wearing modern dress, and that the older the child is wearing more modern dress, and the older woman is wearing more traditional dress. Also, we talked about that. That it looks like she's probably doing some of the painting, also. 
Okay. She's holding something in her hand. Yep. She's kind of looking over her shoulder, looking pretty happy and proud of herself. And you think that the woman and the little girl are from two generations because the woman is wearing um, different clothing from the girl who's wearing somewhat modern clothing. And that um, the woman is painting, but the girl is also probably painting because she's holding something in her hand and she's looking over her shoulder. That's good, you're doing a great job. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you see? I see birds. I see birds and I see flowers and I think I see a pyramid of something. I see. And maybe some flowers or some wheat or some weeds. <laughs> you see birds and flowers and a pyramid of something and weeds. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, good job. Now I'm just going to read to you. You did great. I'm going to read <laughs> now. The best thing is I'm just going to read to you the story from Talking Walls. Okay. So you could even do that. You could just open it up and say, well, let's see what the author said. So many people in India believe that the spirit of the goddess will protect them if they paint pictures on their walls each year for Diwali, a festival, a Hindu festival of lights. One painted stories with birds and lotuses and flowers and pyramids of rice. Thanks Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and prosperity for a beautiful harvest. During the evenings of the festival, small oil lamps called dyas are lit to honor the goddess. Celebra Diwali is celebrated at the new moon near the end of October and begins the new year for Hindus all over the world. And this is the whole picture, and it is intergenerational. It's mm -hmm. passed down from mother to daughter. And it's rice paint, and then it fades, and they do it again the next year. Mm -hmm. so, so that's another way to do it. You just do it, and then you open up and read it. I like that way. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Right, you can do that, and just then you actually are reading the text. A lot. You did a great job. Mm -hmm. You just have to remember the steps. So it's really important to paraphrase. And paraphrase means you can really shorten it up. If they have, nobody's really long-winded, but if, a kid, if they go too long, she thinks that the family is celebrating the moon. And you don't have to say everything. Because the whole idea is to listen to as many people as you can keep in your brain. I can never do more than three. Um, and then the what else do you see? Just so you cover the whole thing. And if you, watch, you can go online and watch tons of people do this. And they, they spend a lot of time going like this. Read the, look at the whole picture. So you can also look at the whole picture. So that's Diwali. There's a lot of books written about Diwali, children's books, because it's a really, um, special holiday for Hindus. So my talking walls, and you know, this is a really old book. So I didn't do this intentionally, but I'm so glad that I did it. So it has the major religions of the world in it. Mm -hmm. So um, without too much fanfare, you can, in, through walls, you can introduce the major religions of the world through a good story, not through conflict or peril, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. we hate you, or you, know, you wear stupid hats. So, and this book was written in 1990. So people can't say, oh, Margie, you shouldn't be writing these books. Because, mm -hmm. oh, Margie wrote these a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And they have just been all re-released or mm -hmm. rethought about. So I love that story. And you can actually make rice, paint, and flour and do your own walls. We used to do that in Winthrop. And we'd come up with a theme, and all the kids would paint, and the wall it would stay. So they felt invested in. Um, so one of the, my favorite school visits ever, and this was way back, probably before we had all the testing and we had all the technology and we had more time to think and be creative. So, one, and you could do this again, it was free. The teacher said, we're so glad you like it, we have no money. And I said, sometimes, so they recreated talking walls in the gym out of refrigerator boxes. Mm -hmm. And every class got a different wall and they, they rendered art or, and then they took you on a tour. Would you like to come to the Lasco Caves with me? You need a flashlight. Would you like to come visit Nelson Mandela's prison cells? 
We wrote quotes on it, and they did that. And they invited the whole family, and the, the whole thing, and they said, well, oh, it's not very, I said, you know what? We all need to do more of this. And especially now, we need to do more of it. And I forget, it was one of those great little schools in Bangor that did that, so. All right, now we're gonna do one that I'm not gonna put up on the wall, because I wanna show you, you don't have to have an LCD projector, you can just have a visual. And this also comes from Talking Walls. And you'll look at this and think, oh my God, there's nothing going on in this picture. But that is so not true. <laughs> That's not true, do you want one? <laughs> okay, so look at the whole thing. So what's good, let's, we'll all just do it together. What's going on in this picture? I think somebody painted this car like men's ties. Okay, so we think someone painted these cars like men's ties. So what do you see that makes you think they're men's ties? The various designs and angles and colors. Because there's so many designs and angles, she thinks someone painted this car to look like men's ties. What else is going on in the picture? I, I think I see more of a Native American type design from the different patterns and the diamonds and the, so some, the hood with the, it just looks like, uh, yeah, more Native So we have one person that thinks the car was painted with men's ties. Someone else thinks perhaps the car is painted with Native American patterns. So what in there makes you think that's Native American patterns? What do you see that makes you think it's Native the American? The stripe at the bottom of the diamonds, the hood with the designs on it. I don't know if you included Americas in your talking walls or if it's other continents, so if it's not Native It's American. the whole world. Whole world, so it, it could goes be. To tw it goes, it's 26 walls and it goes to 22 countries. Perfect. So it could be right Native American. And I was thinking it was an older car, but it might have a sunroof, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so what else do you see? So we see a painted car, maybe men's ties, maybe a Native American motif. What else do we see in the picture? Oh yes, good for you and not oh. saying the wrong side. Ooh, so yes. it's powerful. so the steering wheel is on the other side of the car. So I, the steering wheel on the other side of the car mm -hmm. and maybe a sunroof and we think it's perhaps painted. Is there anything else we can notice about the car? Can anyone read those words at the bottom on the back bumper? On the back bumper, so it looks like there's some words on the back bumper. I, so what what could those words tell you? What would they might tell you about? It could tell you the artist. Maybe the artist autographed the car. Maybe it's some kind of painting car, a car painted. Okay, so thank you very much. You're all correct. I mean, you're good. <laughs> Let's so it, know so it is so interesting. <laughs> if, there were, if this was a room of boys or men, they know everything about this car by looking at it. Oh, oh yeah. The make, the model. They know the make. They know the model because yes. of the, um, what's the thing in the front of the car called? This thing, the grill, <laughs> this grill and the tires. Hey, do you know what the make of the, the car is? The steering wheel was on the other side. I thought that was pretty good. So That's this, good. this is connected to this page in my book. Oh. If you can see, the art's very similar. So this is this is South Africa, and this is end and belly art, and the women, and ch the women learn to paint designs and. Sometimes, often they paint the front of their houses just because they think it's cool and they want to tell people they live there. And sometimes they paint them for different reasons. So this is, this is end of belly art. So um, this is a BMW car. Really? Yes, yeah. yes, it's amazing what we learn if we just hang out together. So this is a BMW and BMW actually for many years have hired artists to paint cars. Andy Warhol did one. And if you look it up, many other very famous people, and they keep them in a museum in Germany. And this was painted by a very famous Nendebelli artist, a woman named Esther. And they hired her, and I don't know, I think the car's still in South Africa. And they asked her in, um, to render her paintings on their car. So, and you can go see it somewhere. Or maybe you'd have to go to 
I'm trying to look it up, so here we go. Esther, a renowned artist, has print, painted walls in France, Japan, and Italy, and is one of the 18 artists from around the world commissioned to paint a BMW. Hmm. In addition to painting and sharing Nendamili wall and head art traditions, Esther teaches young girls how to paint so they too can tell their stories on walls of their homes. So it's passed down from generation. Huh. So they have the 18 cars, famous artists. I know Andy Warhol was one, and I probably should know the others, but I forget. And I think you can go see them somewhere. But I think it's a great nod to this artist that we probably had never heard of. And if I had not written Talking Walls, I wouldn't have heard of her either. Someone must have told me about this, because mm. I don't know how I found out. Mm. My initial reaction is, oh my god, they painted a BMW. I know, they did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. And they've been doing it for years. Well, they've commissioned 18 artists. And yeah. I actually think they commissioned an artist last year. Hmm. They're very picky who they choose, but it's, isn't it a great idea? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a great way to tell stories. So, um, so anyway. Or to make up stories about Or to them. make up stories. So <laughs> I wanted to show you that one because it looks like nothing's going on. Yeah. And you can just get um, you can just get images. Any any we're gonna end with an image that's just fun. I mean it has it's somewhat connected but not really. To show you that it you no, know, obviously everything I did to, with you tonight's very pretty much academic. But um, you can use any visual to tell any story if you just get whoever you're working with talking. OK. So what's going on in this picture? We'll do this one together last. Family photo. So why do you think that's a family? What, what do you see that makes you think that's a family? Well, they're all close. And frankly, a lot of the faces look kind of similar. So we have a family. Their faces look similar. The well, that's why she thinks they're a family. They all <laughs> the haircuts. Haircuts by the same person. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps yeah. they all yeah. got haircuts by the same the person. Perhaps not the one. <laughs> perhaps not the youngest one, but Doesn't most of them. Doesn't have enough hair. hair. <laughs> OK, so this is a family. They all had their hair cut. You think they're a family because it looks, their faces somewhat look alike, and they look like the same person cut all their hair. What else is going on in here? Anything else? What's going on? They're sitting on a picnic table. I so they're, think. they're sitting on a picnic so table. So they might be in the backyard. They could be on a backyard. They're might sitting on a picnic table. Could be a family reunion. Yeah, it could be cousins as well. This could be cousins. This could be a family the same, reunion. Some of the same age. Yeah. They're sitting on. They're sitting on a table. They, some of them look alike. They look like they all had the same haircut, except the little one, because the little one doesn't have any hair. Otherwise, they have the same haircut. So what else do you see in this picture? I think it's hard to tell what, what gender they are. Some of them. So it's hard to tell if they're boys and girls, probably because of their haircut. It's a outside. warm season. They're wearing shorts. Okay, it's some, warm. Some They're wearing, wearing shorts. Short, short sleeves. Like and if you, I'm just going to, yeah, the let's look in the back. I'm going to just turn this off for a minute so we can look in the background. So if you look oh, in the background. Okay. It does look like it's in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So oh. this is a group of people that could be a family because they have similar faces and the same haircut. Some, some person gave them the same haircut. They're sitting on a bench. It's probably summer because some of them are wearing shorts and there's things blooming in the background. Okay, is there anything else that we have not talked about in this picture? Okay, thank you very much for sharing. You're very close. So this is me. I was going to oh. say, is that you in the middle? That's me. Oh, not oh. in the middle, but I was looking at the faces. So this is my family you are picture. Correct. You are correct. So these are all girls, except that's a boy. And that's not in our family. Who is our neighbor? Oh, a neighbor. <laughs> so these are my, some of my siblings. I have 10 brothers and sisters. Wow. So um, Mara, Margie, Sarah, Lisa. Daria, uh, Marianne, and that's Nick. Mm -hmm. and, but we also had more up there, and we, uh, that's a neighbor. And it was summer, and we were sitting outside, and somebody took our picture. And where? 
I grew up outside Philadelphia, so okay. I assume this is somewhere in our backyard yeah, or our neighbor's Philadelphia. backyard. Oh my goodness. And we had the same haircut until like yeah. ninth grade. Funny. It wasn't I, good. Seriously, I was sitting yeah. going, this is it's our family, but I thought you were the middle one. I no, so this was, I was probably six or seven. Well, how old do you think I was in this? I was really tall then, too. Oh, well, I think you're eight. Maybe eight, mm -hmm. so that was probably 1962. So How many sisters do you have? I have six sisters and four brothers. Okay. And wow. what, are you, what, what did you say you were age-wise? Um, or did you? So this, she's older and she's older. I would have thought you were the older. They're younger. And I had one other brother that hadn't been born. And <laughs> we had John. <laughs> and four more that are, John, Lisa. And three more that, I don't know, they're off somewhere else. They got their own haircuts. Oh, my God. <laughs> So that's a, that's so you can do it with that too. You can do it with yeah. anything. <laughs> anything. It's probably good for mental health issues. You can you can do it with anything if you just get people connected and get them talking mm -hmm. and keep that sort of keep that protocol going. There's no VTS police that are going to chase you around. So you just do the best you can. So I mean what VTS stands. Visual thinking visual. strategies. Thank you. So I've just adapted it, and I call it visual thinking learning, because mine really has a learning component. So I'm just inspired by them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking forward to doing this with uh, the elderly, because that's what I'm working on. Oh yes, with. absolutely. I'm working with now one to one, and I can see that yes. um, it will be something that they can really focus on. Yeah. And, and you can use family pictures. Yeah. So at. Um, at the workshop I did in Boston, I spent the night, but a lot of people went home and she, we got homework and we had to go home and do it with someone, but I, I just went, walked around Boston and just looked at things. But a woman came back and she had a 33-year-old disabled daughter who went to adult daycare and she went home and she did this with her daughter and she was going to go to the daycare the next day and said, I found something for you to do with, her, this, with this population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her daughter loved it. Mm -hmm. Just loved it. Mm -hmm. She was stunned. She came in the next day just, I can't, I, I can't wait to tell you. Do you know what things really um, got her involved? In she must have, she just took out pictures she had at home. Uh -huh. She just they were able to connect it. Right away. Immediately. Immediately. So I just think you'd have to figure out the pictures or I think it'd be great to try. I mean, I, my my granddaughter's now two and a half, but I've been doing this. She's she's very 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 verbal, and I get a lot of credit for this. It's not only <laughs> me, but they said, "Mom, it's because she spends so much time with you, and all the two of you do is talk." And, she, <laughs> and she's brilliant. And I no, she really isn't. She just talks a lot. She just talks nonstop because I talk to her nonstop. We pretty much just play and talk. So, um, and I use, I, and I, I even think about that when I'm, I always say, well, what else, Penny? Now everything, why? Why does this happen? Why? I'm like, oh, I wish I never taught you this. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> so anyway, so there, I'm going to, I can sign some books. Yeah. And if, um, good luck, have fun. I'm available if you want me to come do any training with any of your people or any children. It, you really, really need to practice this or for it to really work. Or, you, or I think one-on-one -on is fine. It's in, if you just do one-on-one, -on -one, you can practice it with one person. But if you want to do it in a group setting, you really need